So perhaps to kick things off today, maybe we could start, or maybe you could explain why humans need some biological stress and, and, and how maybe modern day society has made that difficult to uh, achieve. Yeah, during evolution, uh, organisms evolved in environments that were very stressful, even from the simplest of microorganisms like bacteria, where they had to be able to tolerate changes in levels of salinity in the water, of exposure to metals that are potentially toxic like iron and selenium uh, and zinc. And they evolved ways not only that they could resist the toxic effects of these exposures, but actually benefit from them. So, for example, in the case of iron and selenium, we know that now that we need iron and selenium for proper health, but high levels of iron and selenium are actually toxic. And so cells evolve mechanisms where they actually incorporate iron into proteins and use the iron adaptively in ways that help them cope with stress. Um, In the case of selenium, for example, uh, several of the antioxidant enzymes, that is the proteins in our cells that are able to remove free radicals, those proteins themselves, the antioxidant enzymes, have selenium incorporated into them. So that's one example. And then as we move up the evolutionary tree into multicellular organisms and animals, uh, they evolved in stressful environments. And two of the major stresses are actually um, food scarcity and predation and competition with other organisms. So individuals that were able to uh, best handle these kinds of stressors, and certainly uh, food scarcity is a stressor, uh, and animals will starve to death if they don't get food. But that stress of the food scarcity is actually a motivating factor, and nervous systems evolved to overcome food scarcity in in many different ways. Uh, So those are some examples of And in the case of exercise, individuals whose bodies function well in a food-deprived state and environments where there's potential for predation were those that survived and passed their genes on. So whatever it is those genes did that helped them uh, perform physically well in a in a you know food-deprived state had a survival advantage we have access to food 24 hours a day, all day, all night. We have, um, we don't, you know, necessarily need to exercise to get our food either. Uh, we can just, you know, get in the car and, and drive somewhere. We can even have our groceries delivered, you know, to our door. So you've, you've talked a lot about how, you know, this constant access to food and not having these periods of food scarcity where people are not eating may have detrimental consequences on overall health? Yes. One way to look at that is that when when we have food available all the time and when we don't have the need to exercise to get through life, our cells become complacent. They and they do not maintain their ability to cope with the kinds of stressors that cause disease. Oxidative stress is one key example, inflammation. Uh, so for a good example is muscle cells and exercise. During the exercise, it's a major stress on the cells in the muscles. There's a big increase in free radical production. There's, uh, the cells are electrically active, the muscle cells, so that they can contract. So there's ion fluxes that have to be dealt with. And however, 
having been exposed to that stress during the exercise, the cells activate gene programs that help them cope with stress and become stronger and more resilient. So for example, exercise increases antioxidant defenses in muscle cells. It enhances the ability of the muscle cells to clear out damaged proteins, dysfunctional organelles such as mitochondria, which are the energy producing organelle in the cell. And as well, there are proteins that are initially called heat shock proteins, but their function is to protect other proteins from being damaged. So all of these beneficial mechanisms are stimulated by exercise. So in a person who's sedentary, they have reduced intrinsic antioxidant defenses. They have accumulation of molecular garbage in their cells, accumulation of mitochondria that aren't functioning well, and uh, accumulated accumulation of abnormal proteins. And this is also true in brain cells, which is the main thing I study, nerve cells in the brain. There's evidence that's emerging, some from my lab, some from others, that physical exercise, mental exercise, what you and I are doing now around to keeping our mind intellectually engaged, we're right now exercising our nerve cells. They're more electrically active. There's more free radicals being produced in our brain cells right now than there would be if we weren't intellectually engaged. But it's not only okay, it's a good thing because at the same time, the cells are beefing up their antioxidant defenses bolstering their mitochondrial function. In fact, uh, we discovered that, and, and this was originally described by exercise physiologists, and it makes sense. Uh, when you exercise regularly, your muscles get bigger, and in the case of endurance muscles, better endurance. And associated with that, there's an increased number of mitochondria healthy mitochondria in each muscle cell. So that makes sense that the cells then are more able to generate the ATP to support their function. We find a similar thing in nerve cells when they're active, and that most of this is from animal studies, and so we're extrapolating the humans. But in animals, we can look more directly at the brain in kind of an intrusive way. And we find that Running wheel exercise, uh, what we call environmental enrichment, where we have the animals in cages where they have um, essentially like playground type environment where they can maintain their mind more active. And under those conditions, exercise, mental exercise, there's an increase in the number of mitochondria in nerve cells. And associated with that, in some, at least in some brain regions, there can even be an increase in the number of synapses between nerve cells, the connections between the nerve cells. Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of a, the general thinking that it's important to keep stressing in a good way, in an evolutionarily conserved way, that is, by stresses that are have been normally encountered through millions of years. Um, these transient, short-term, mild energetic stresses, either the energetic stress of expending a lot of energy during exercise or the more kind of subtle energetic stress of depriving cells of energy uh, for some extended time period. And we can, I'm sure we're going to talk about what's going on in terms of signaling pathways and, for example, ketones, which are elevated during fasting and during sustained exercise. And you mentioned you talked to Eric Verdin, Verdin about his work with, um, with, um, enzymes called 
acetylases. And his work showing that ketones have signaling functions, in fact, gene expression through modulating these enzymes called the acetylases. Um, so fasting does the same thing. <laughs>